switch over. Oh, you'll do it, okay. Okay. Well, it's so good to be here. I'm so happy. I, in studying the books of the Bible, when I first started, uh, way back, four or five years ago, uh, I would never have thought that I would be here uh, standing in front of you. I had never given a sermon before. Um, I had never really preached. I never even led a Sabbath school lesson, okay? But I wanted to learn, and I think it was my prayer that was answered that I wanted to learn more about the Bible. And the place that I started was the book of Esther. And just about everything that you have learned this weekend came about as a result of me studying the book of Esther. I went through the book of Esther line by line, trying to figure out where the sanctuary was, what was going on in the book of Esther, and I came across many puzzling things. And that stirred me to look at other parts of the Bible to try to figure those things out. And so everything that you've learned this weekend has been a spin-off of me trying to figure out the book of Esther. So the good news is, is we've worked backwards. You have all of this understanding now about the sanctuary, about the 13, 14, 15, the Passover, all of that. And now we're going to delve into the book of Esther, and you're going to see something that I think is very, very exciting. And I think this is probably the pinnacle of everything that you've learned this week. And if you can draw on all of that, you will start to, you will start to see and find out that the book of Esther almost was not a book of the Bible. It almost didn't even get into the canon. But I believe that it's there today, and it's there today for our benefit. And I believe that God made sure that the book of Esther was put into the Bible today for our purposes. If you know that, know that the book of Esther doesn't even have the name of God in it, okay? Did you know that out of all of the books of the Old Testament, the Essenes, who were a very small select group of scribes that lived in isolation, they would get up and they would copy the Old Testament books. And this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from, if you're not aware of that. And whenever they would come to the word Yahweh, they would bathe, they would wash themselves, and then they would write the name Yahweh. They had to be, I mean, this is how strict they were. They never got married. They basically went to these areas way out in the desert, and they would copy these, these scripts for us. Do you know that they copied every single book of the Old Testament except for one book? They would not copy the book because they thought it was too vulgar. It was the book of Esther. So we don't have the book of Esther in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But it doesn't stop there, folks. Here's an article in 2013. Should Christians read the book of Esther? I'll read to you. This is a, a piece by Joel Miller. Uh, originally ran under the title, You're Reading the Wrong Book of Esther. Listen to what he says here. The book of Esther occupies a controversial place in the Bible. John Calvin did not include the book in his biblical commentaries and only referenced it once in the Institutes, his Institutes of the Christian Religion that you may have read. Though he did include it in his Bible, Martin Luther was highly ambivalent about it. He said, quote, this is Martin Luther, I am so great an enemy to Esther that I wish it had not come to us at all, for it has too many heathen unnaturalities, he said in Table Talk 24. And in one exchange with Erasmus, he said, it deserves to be regarded as non-canonical. Okay, did you know that? The book of Esther was not looked upon. It was too Jewish. But let me present to you a hypothesis today. I will, I, what I hope to present to you is that the book of Esther actually is the entire great controversy from beginning to end in chronological order, with every person in the part playing a specific part in the great controversy. Let's, let's begin. But before we begin, I want to show a little bit of validity to the book of Esther. Do you know, did you know that the book of Esther may have been referenced by Jesus Christ in the New Testament? Let's get out Matthew 18. 
I'm going to read it to you. Let's read it together. I'm going to read from the King James, Matthew 18, verse 23. As soon as I start to read, you will recognize one of the most famous parables that Jesus ever uttered. <clears throat> Starting in verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for so much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosened him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me thou thou owest. And his fellow servants fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him and said, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise, my heavenly Father, do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Do you notice something about this if you're reading it? These are the words of Christ. Early on, we said, we looked in the, in the spirit of prophecy, and Ellen White said, when you read the words of Christ, they have a deeper meaning than is portended on the surface. Correct? So what is this? Whenever, I read, whenever we get to this in the Sabbath school lesson, the lesson is always about forgiveness. Right? It's always about forgiveness. And that is a true lesson. That is what this means. But there is something much more to this. Does anyone catch it? Did anyone catch something in there? What was it? What is that? It's about Haman and Mordecai. Okay. <clears throat> I'm more of a numbers person. Did you notice anything about the numbers in here? This is, this is how I... You want to know how do you study the Bible? 10,000 talents. Why 10,000 talents? Do you know that 10,000 talents was exactly what Haman so sold the Jews for? It is exactly the same amount. In fact, let's look at the history of the Jews. Let's look at the book of Esther. We know the book of Esther. We don't have to go through it. We know that in 474 BC is when the book of Esther took place. We know this very well because we know exactly when Xerxes, who was a Hasuerus, took the throne. And in the opening salvo of Esther, we know exactly when this started. It was in the three and a half years, right? This is when it started. So we know that Haman's death decree occurred in 474 BC. But then what happened? We know that <clears throat> they were sold for 10,000 talents of silver. But then God raised up Esther for such a time as this, and she saved the Jews. So the Jews were saved from utter destruction. How much did they owe God? How much numerically did they owe God? Ten, that was what the price was, correct? Exactly. And so for 10,000 talents of silver, that's how much they owed God. Then what happened? In 457 BC, just a short while later, God forgave them that debt and said, I want you to go and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Why? Finish transgression, make an end of sins, reconcile for iniquity, and confirm the covenant for one week. That's all in 457 BC. Then what happens? They went and they did that, and the descendants of those people that had begged for forgiveness nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. 
in 31 AD. The Christians they persecuted. Saul himself killed many Christians until finally they stoned Stephen in 34 AD. Do you remember how much Christ was sold for? 30 pieces of silver. That's correct. 30 pieces of silver. And when Judas tried to return the money to them, what did they do with the money? They would not accept that money. They would not accept payment of that money. Correct? That is correct. And so what happened in 34 AD? The 70-week prophecy ends. Stephen is killed by the Jews. Saul becomes Paul, and now the message goes to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. But for those Jews refusing the message, they decided to stay in Jerusalem, and in 70 AD, Jerusalem is destroyed, and the Jews are turned over to the tormentors. Now let's look at, let's look at Matthew. Matthew 18.23. Because in Matthew 18.23, we have a king who's looking at debts. Does the king of the universe have someone that owes them a debt? Yes, they do. And wouldn't you know it? It's exactly the same debt. 10,000 talents of silver. But that king forgives the debt. Right? We just read it. But what happens? That very same servant, the Jews, torments a fellow servant, the Christians. They demand repayment of that debt. But it never happens. Even though they beg for forgiveness, he doesn't forgive them. And just as the Jews' forgiveness ends after the 70-week prophecy, so does in this parable the forgiveness end of the servant. And in this case, the debt is 100 pence. The actual word there in the Greek is denarii. Pence is the old English term. The pence is a derivative of the denarii. So it's really 100 denarii. And so what happens to this fellow servant. The king finds out, ends forgiveness, and just as the Jews in Jerusalem are turned over to the tormentors, so too is this servant turned over to the tormentors. This is not just a parable on forgiveness. This is a prophecy about what is to happen to those in Jerusalem. Do you want to know what's really interesting? Jesus tells this parable in response to something. Go back. Go back. I, I find this fascinating. I find this fascinating. This all starts off in verse 23 with the word, therefore. What should that tell you? There's something that happens before this. Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Peter, how often shall I forgive those who sin against me? The rule was three times. Peter wants to be magnanimous and says, I'll do it seven times. What does Jesus say? Not seven times, but 70 times. 70 times seven. Wow. That's the 70 week prophecy. That's the 70 week prophecy. Seven times 70 is 490 years, which is exactly the amount of time that the Jews had from forgiveness in 457 BC. This pair, Ellen White says it. Every word has its meaning. The words of Christ have a deeper meaning than what is on the surface. So you say, 10,000 talents of silver. 10,000 talents of silver. I see a problem, Roger, here. 30 pieces of silver, 100 denarii. That's a different value. Check this out. This is what I... This will, give you, this will give you chills. By the way, what day, as we'll find out, what day of the year did Haman sell the Jews on? It was the 13th day of the first month, Nisan 13. It's right there, right there in Esther. What day was Jesus sold? Jesus was sold two days before the Feast of Unleavened Bread by Judas, Nisan 13. 
The word that is used, you know, when the servant falls down before the king and begs for forgiveness, the Greek word there is proskyne. I'm not a Greek scholar. But it literally, if you look it up, it means to fall on one's knees and worship. That is exactly what the Jews in Persia did when Haman had sold them. Esther and her other ladies that were in the house with her, they fasted for three days and they prayed and they worshipped God. Okay? If we look and see what the fellow servant did to the Jews, that's different. It's a different word there that is used in Greek. It's parakaliai. I'm not a Greek scholar which means to summon, to entreat, to admonish. That is exactly what the Christians were doing to the Jews at that time. The Christians were trying to admonish them, to entreat them, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That is what Stephen was doing, and eventually that was what Paul was doing. This is a perfect, perfect prophecy. But you say, what about the 30 pieces of silver and the 100 pence? You have to understand these are two different denominations, two different denominations of currency. Check this out. So if you go to Wikipedia and you look up the denarii, this is the Roman currency, you will see at certain times, 267 BC, 211 BC, 200 BC, it had a certain amount of grams of silver in it. At the time that Jesus Christ gave this parable, which was from 1480 to 37 AD, the weight of a denarii was 3.9 grams of silver. 3.9 grams of silver in a denarii. So how many denarii was owed to the servants? 100 denarii. So how many grams of silver are we talking about? 390 grams of silver. Does everyone understand that? Okay. So how much? So he was just forgiven 10,000 talents of silver, but now this fellow servant owed him 390 grams of silver. Okay. So 100 denarii times 3.9 grams equals 390 grams of silver. Now let's talk about this, this, the 30 pieces of silver that Jesus was sold for. Now, where did that money come from? It came from the priests. The priests only dealt with one type of currency, the Tyrian shekel. When Jews from all over the world came to the Passover, they had to convert their money into the money of the temple, which was the Tyrian shekel. It was minted in Tyre because they had the coins with the highest amount of silver in them. That's why you had money changers. Guess what? Here is an article from 2008 called The Rare Silver Coin Found in Excavations in Jerusalem. And guess what? They happened to come from the second temple period. Perfect. That's when Jesus was there. So let's read about this type of currency. And they talk about a rare silver coin, the type used to pay the half shekel tax. This is actually a full shekel, but you could pay it with one coin, and you could pay it for two. Remember the coin that was found in the fish's mouth? That was a shekel. That could pay for two temple taxes. Remember Christ asked to pay for Peter and himself? One coin, half shekel tax, you could pay for two people. A rare ancient silver coin, the type used to pay the half shekel tax in ancient times, was recently discovered in an archaeological excavation that is being conducted around the walls around Jerusalem National Park near the city of David in what was the main drainage channel of Jerusalem during the Second Temple period. <clears throat> the annual half-shekel head tax was given in shekel and half-shekel coins from the Tyre Mint. They were struck in the year 125 BCE until the outbreak of the Greek Revolt in 66. So is this during the time of Christ? Absolutely. At the time of the uprising, the tax was paid using the Jerusalem Shechem. They were specifically minted for this purpose. In the rabbinic sources, it states, the silver mentioned in the Pentateuch is always Tyrian silver. Is it Tyrian silver? It is a Jerusalemite. Many have interpreted this to mean that only Tyrian shekels could be used to pay the half shekel head tax in the temple. Okay? So this is the unique, exclusive currency of the priests. If the priests were going to pay for Judas to betray Christ, this is the money that they would use. 
The shekel was found in the excavation. Guess how much a shekel weighed? They found the coin, they put it on the scale. Guess how much it weighed? 13 grams. How many pieces of shekel was Christ sold for? Three, 30 pieces of silver. What's 30 times 13? 390 grams of silver. 390 grams of silver. Not only did Christ predict exactly when Jerusalem would fall, he also named the price that he would be sold for in that one parable. Let me tell you something else that this does. Today, in the, evangel in the evangelical world, have you heard of left behind? Have you heard of the pre-tribulation secret rapture? There is a theology that believes that the 70th week of Daniel chapter 9 is cut off from the 70-week prophecy and put into the future. And those seven years are going to be seven years of tribulation that are going to occur. But before those seven years of tribulation occur, there's going to be a secret rapture where God takes away all of his loyal people so they don't have to go through the, the tribulation. What an evil theology. Because when you are on this planet and you believe that and you're going through tribulation, you're going to feel like you are lost. What does this, what does this prophecy tell us? It tells us beyond a shadow of a doubt that that 70th week has already happened. It has already happened. This prophecy just by itself completely undermines futurism, if you understand it. And the numbers match up perfectly. And what does it also say? It also means that Christ validates the book of Esther. Because it's only in the book of Esther that we learn that the Jews were sold for a thousand talents of silver. Do you see this? The book of Esther is inspired. So let's talk about the great controversy in the book of Esther, because I believe it is a completely it is a complete replay of the great controversy. King Xerxes is God the Father. Esther is Jesus Christ. Wait, you'll see. Mordecai is the Holy Spirit. Queen Vashti is Lucifer. Haman is Lucifer and Babylon, and the Jews are the righteous saints. Let's go through what happens. For those of you who don't remember the book of Esther, there's a 180-day feast. There's a public wine feast of seven days in a garden. Vashti refuses to appear before Ahasuerus. Vashti is deposed, but not executed. There is a search for a new queen. Esther has taken place to be made queen. Now, you may remember statements in the Spirit of Prophecy that validates the actions of Vashti and calls into question what King Xerxes did. That's not the point. Who, what, what was Jesus Christ? He fulfilled the sign of Jonah, correct? What did Jonah do? He ran away from his, from his uh, duties. Was he a good man or a bad man in doing that? Not good, right? But yet, that is the sign of Christ, because as he was in the belly of the whale for three days, so will Christ be in the belly of the earth for three days. So just because they individually may have been good or bad or done, that's irrelevant in the, in the grand scale in terms of using parallelisms, okay? So I understand what you're saying or thinking there, but you'll see. Next, Haman's plot to exterminate the Jews. Mordecai saves the king's life. That's Big Than and Teresh that raised their hand against the king. Haman is promoted. Despite that, this is a real interesting point because it's Mordecai that saves the king's life, but yet Haman is promoted. It'll make sense. Haman resents Mordecai and wants to take revenge on his race, the Jews. Haman's decree to exterminate the Jews occurs on Nisan 13, the first month of the year, to be executed on Adar 13, the last month of the year. Esther champions the cause of her people. The Jews fast. Mordecai appeals to Esther. Esther accepts the challenge. Esther goes before the king and lives. And then Esther entertains the kings at a, a king at a banquet. We have the fall of Haman then. Haman's plot to hang Mordecai. King reminded of Mordecai's service. Haman is compelled to honor Mordecai. There's the second night of the same banquet. Esther accuses Haman before the king. Haman is executed on his own gallows. Then Mordecai is elevated. He countermands Haman's death decree, which cannot be reversed. Mordecai advances his people and restores the favor. There's deliverance of the Jews. There's the proclamation of the Feast of Purim. 
and Mordecai is made prime minister of Persia. Okay, so I want to show some parallelisms here. Let's go, from the, let's go through this slowly. So in the book of Esther, we have the king of Persia who sat on his throne and ruled over the largest empire the world has ever known. You know, the king, God the Father, sits on his throne and rules over all the universe. The queen was insubordinate to the king of Persia, and a top commander in God's army was insubordinate to the king of the universe. That's Lucifer. Now, this was done at a seven-day wine feast known as a mishta. And whenever you see this word mishta used in the Bible, there's always a feast followed by some sort of judgment. Feast, judgment, like Belshazzar's feast, then there was a judgment. Pharaoh's birthday party, Baker and the butler. Whenever that word is used, there's always a judgment that follows. Um, there was an investigation that was done in the kingly courts of Persia to decide what should be done with Queen Vashti, and she was eventually deposed and expelled out of the courts for the better of those remaining, as she would have been a bad influence, according to them, right? What do they say? Well, pff, if this woman starts to you know, go against her husband, then all the women in the, in the country are going to go against their husbands, and all kind of orders going to break down. It's better for her to be deposed. That's what they came up with. And then, well, we'll talk about war in a little bit. Now, in heaven, Lucifer had free will to choose which doctrine he would follow. And there was an investigation that was done in heaven, an investigative judgment, in the kingly court to decide what should be done with Lucifer. And he was eventually deposed, not murdered, not killed, not destroyed. And he was expelled out of heaven for the better of those remaining, as he would have had a bad influence. Now, we know in heaven, there was war in heaven, right? And in that war, who were the casualties in that war? A third of the angels were cast out of heaven. And Satan was offered, Lucifer was offered multiple times to repent, but he refused. Interesting what happens. Because we know when this happened, um, actually, before we get to that, let me just, we talked about a mishta. That's the Jewish word there for mishta. It's used several times in the Old Testament. It's usually a wine banquet. We see it with Isaac when, she, when he was weaned from Sarah and Abraham. They made a mishta. Pharaoh had a birthday party. That was a mishta. They had the baker and the butler. Samson had a mishta for his wife. And then you had the riddle about the lion and the honey, and those 30 fellows lost their clothes. Nabel and Abigail, uh, da David. Uh, Daniel and his three friends eating at the king's table. Belshazzar writing on the wall. This word mishta, whenever it's used, there's always a judgment that happens after it. Keep that in mind. Now, I talked about war in heaven. We know that between chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Esther, there's a period of time. And we know what that time period is. And we know that 480 BC falls directly in between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now, in the parallel, we have war in heaven. Guess what happens on earth? Xerxes goes to battle. And the battle is the, probably the most famous battle of European history ever, known as the Battle of Thermopylae. Many movies have been made about it. It's where 300 Spartan soldiers defend against tens of thousands of, of Persian soldiers. And so you have this god king, Xerxes, who is battling against Leonidas and the Greeks. As it turns out, and, and this, by the way, is a photograph taken at the very place of Thermopylae. And uh, you can see a statue there of Leonidas. Western culture has seen that Leonidas was the hero of that battle, even though they lost, because they stood against the Persians. But in, in actuality, if you look at this, in 480 BC, the Battle of Thermopylae occurred. It was known as the Battle of the Hot Gates or the Battle of the Gates of Hell, because it was around this era that there was thermal baths. That's why it's known as Thermopylae. This god king Xerxes led 60,000 troops to fight a very small Spartan force of 300. He lost about a third of his army. Interestingly, he had a special guard of soldiers known as the Immortals. And Leonidas, the leader of the Spartans, was defiant, even though Xerxes offered him king of Greece. This is what he said. He said, I would rather die than serve you, essentially. And he has this famous quote that says, Xerxes says, put down your weapons. He says, come and take them. And it's written there in Greek, and it's actually written on that Greek statue of Leonidas. By the way, Leonidas is 
meaning the lion, right? Seeking whom he may devour. It says there in, in 1 Peter 5, 8, Lucifer is noted as a lion seeking whom he may devour. Lucifer, Lucifer was offered forgiveness before the war started, but he refused. And of course, you know that God lost about a third of his angels. So what's the next thing that happens in Esther chapter 2? We know in the great controversy that the plan of salvation was instituted very early on, even before man was created. And in this situation, Esther becomes the queen taking the place of Queen Vashti. This is after Xerxes comes back from the battle. So in the book of Esther, we know that Esther grew up in obscurity. Esther hid her origins until the time was right. Esther was orphaned and raised by an adopted father. Esther was fully Jew, and she was, became fully queen. And it was only because of this duality that she was able to plead for her people. The Targum states that Esther was as beautiful as the morning star. Esther was visited every single day by her cousin Mordecai, and Esther was loved by the king more than any of the other women. In the great controversy, we know that Jesus grew up in obscurity. Jesus also hid his origins until the time was right. Jesus was orphaned by, on earth and was raised by an adopted father. Jesus was fully man and fully divine, and it was only because of this duality that he was able to intercede on behalf of his people. Jesus is the morning star, and Jesus was trained every single day by the Holy Spirit. And of Jesus, the Heavenly Father said, Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, the next thing that happens in the great controversy is the fall of Adam and Eve. The plan of salvation instituted, and now the fall of Adam and Eve. We know that Adam and Eve were given a special place of honor in the kingdom of God, but Adam and Eve raised their hand against the king of the universe. And it was occurred because one of them left their post. An investigation was done and conducted, and they were found guilty, and they were sentenced to death. In the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. And Adam was told, in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, and Eve, thy desire shall be to thy husband. Well, if you read in the book of Esther, there's two people that are there, Bigthan and Teresh, that kept the door of the king. And they sought to lay hand on the king. And it occurred, if you look in the Megillah, 13b, while one of them, they were found out because one of them had left their posts. And there was an inquisition was made of the matter, and it was found out that both of them actually were hung on a tree uh, in Esther 2.23. Interestingly, the word big than means in the press giving meat, so out of the sweat of thy brow, and teresh means desire. So what comes next? Who was the person that figured out that Bigthan and Teresh were going to kill the king? Mordecai. Who should have been elevated? Mordecai. But he was not. Right after Adam and Eve sinned and left the Garden of Eden, what type of religious power started to gain prominence? Was it the true religion? Or was it false religion? False religion. And so we do not see Mordecai rising up in power. We see another power rising up. We see Haman. Haman is a man who demands worship. Haman is a man who hates Mordecai. By the way, Haman is the descendant of King Agag. King Agag was the, was the king that Saul did not kill, even though Samuel told them to wipe out all of the Amalekites. So, Haman wants to kill all the Jews because Mordecai will not bow down to him. He informs the king that there are some people in his kingdom that don't follow his laws, and they should be put to death. And he's willing to pay the treasury 10,000 talents of silver. He demands worship, and he gets the king to issue a death decree. Now, you have to be very careful and understand this. When the Persians wrote a law, you could not... Bring it back. Remember, remember Daniel? When the king wrote the law and the king found out that Daniel was about to go into the lion's den, they searched day and night for some loophole that they could get Daniel out, but they could not find it. And so finally, Daniel had to be placed into the lion's den. Not even the king himself can reverse the law of the Persians. And so when Haman was successful in getting the king to write a law that would exterminate the Jews, that law is immovable. It's irrevocable. Folks, 
is there a people in the universe that do not follow the king's laws? Yes, it's planet Earth. And is that law immutable? Yes, you cannot change it. We represent, that death decree is the death decree of Adam on all of us. That is in the great controversy. Just as Haman wanted to see this death decree placed on those that he hated, Lucifer knows that you all in here, when you go to heaven, are going to be replacing those angels that were lost. This is what Lucifer says in, in um, Prophets and Kings 588. Are these the people that are going to take my place in heaven and the place of the angels who united with me? They profess to obey the law of God, but have they kept its precepts? Have they not been lovers of self more than lovers of God? Have they not placed their own interests above his service? Have they not loved the things of the world? Look at the sins that have marked their lives. Behold their selfishness, their malice, their hatred of one another. Will God banish me and my angels from his presence and yet reward those who have been guilty of the same sins? Thou canst not do this. O Lord, in justice, justice demands that sentence be pronounced against them. When Haman convinces the king to write that death decree, that is Satan accusing you. And yes, it is true, we have violated a law that cannot be changed. And so the death decree goes out, and the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day. Even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take a spoil for them for a prey. Did you notice here that the people that are getting the death decree are the same people in Matthew 18? The man would be sold and his wife and his children. Did you catch that? It's exactly the same. And so the death decree goes out. And all of the Jews, the death decree is a typology of the death decree given to Adam and his offspring by God and accused by Lucifer. It is a law that cannot be changed. Young, old, male, female, everyone are under its charge. There is no escape. It's going to wipe out all. And there is absolutely no hope without an intercessor. And this is where we are in the great controversy. And so the plan of salvation is executed into action. This is book, this is the uh, book of Esther 4. All the king's servants. So Mordecai is there. Mordecai is there. And he is in sackcloth and ashes. And Esther is like, what's wrong with Mordecai? And Mordecai sends a messenger to Esther. And he says, you need to go to the king to intercede. Here's the problem. Esther has not been in the presence of the king for 30 days. She doesn't know how she's doing with him. Who does Esther represent? She represents Jesus Christ. How long had Jesus Christ been on this earth before he started his ministry? 30 years. If Christ had committed one sin in those 30 years, would he be able to intercede on our behalf? If Christ had committed one sin and ascended into the holy place in heaven, would he have stood a chance? He would have been killed himself. I believe that this book of Esther is telling us what Esther is going through is what Jesus Christ went through for us. She says, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, that's the holy place, who is not called, there is one law for him to be put to death. Except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter. Is the king going to hold out the golden scepter to someone who is sinful? No. You have to be a perfect sacrifice. Who is not called? There is one law. He may live. But I have not been called unto the king for 30 days. I'm scared to go. I don't know what my standing is with the king. He hasn't called me in 30 days. I may die if I go. We may not have that relationship that we used to have. And they told Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself 
that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. Think about that. Jesus is also a man. He is in the same predicament as mankind is. If he doesn't go and be the savior for all, he himself is locked into being a man. And is also, if, if Christ had never died on the cross, do you think Christ would have lived forever? He eventually would have died. And with his death would be mankind's loss. This is what Mordecai is saying to him, her. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then thou shalt be enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? I love those words because it gives me hope. Then Esther bade them to return to Mordecai this answer. Go, gather the people. Gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and I will go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Haman ordered the law on the 13th day of the first month. Mordecai went into ash, cloth, ash and sackcloth the very next day. Nisan 14. On the very day that Esther resigns herself to die, if it must be so, Nisan 14 is the very day that Jesus Christ did die. Nisan 14. And for those three days that she and her maidens are fasting, Jesus Christ lay in the tomb fasting. So what happens that? Now it came to pass on the third day, Nisan 16, Resurrection Day, to be. She gets up, she puts on her royal apparel, and she ascends into the inner court of the king to plead against a law that cannot be changed. Do you see it? Do you see the plan of salvation? It's in Esther, 1,500 years, 2,500 years ago. And so when the king, so here it is, so chapter 5. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inter, inner court of the king's house. Let me explain this. Imagine the king is here sitting on his throne, looking this way. There is a chamber, and then there's a door right here, and the door is open. And then there is the inner court over here. The king can see through that door into the inner court. And when someone appears in the inner court with the guard, if the king does not put forth his scepter, they die here in the inner court. Most holy place, holy place. Do you understand? If the king puts forth the scepter, she then is accepted, and then she can draw near, walk through the door, And she's now in the, in the throne room of the king. Why did they do it this way? There was a problem with assassinations. They didn't want anyone to get too close to the king. So if it wasn't accepted over there, that's where they dealt with it. And so it was when the king saw Esther, sorry, in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. That's an old English way of just describing what I just showed you. Okay? And it was so, when the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near, touched the top of the scepter, and then the king said unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be given to thee even up to half the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good to the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto a banquet that I have prepared. Let's go through this. Jesus was absent from his father for 30 years prior to his ministry, but was given encouragement from the Holy Spirit to embark on his mission. Esther was absent for the king for 30 days prior to her ministry, but was given encouragement from Mordecai to embark on her mission. Only Jesus, because of his divinity, could stand in the, mo in the holy and the most holy place and in the presence of God and live, but he could die 
if there was any sin found in him. Only Esther, because of her royalty, could stand in the inner court and then the presence of the king and live. But she could die if he did not find favor in her. Jesus asked his disciples to pray and to fast for him as he struggled with his decision in the Garden of Gethsemane. Esther asked all the Jews in Shushan to fast and pray for her as she struggled with her decision. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father and resigned to die as it was necessary on Nisan 14 and rested in the tomb on Nisan 14, 15, and 16. Esther submitted to the will of Mordecai and resigned to die if it was necessary on Nisan 14 and fasted and prayed on Nisan 14, 15, and 16. There's more. On Nisan 16, Jesus put on his royal apparel and rose up and went into heaven in the inner chamber, the holy place, and was accepted into God's presence. On Nisan 16, Esther put on her royal apparel and rose up and went into the inner chamber of the king's palace and was accepted and asked to enter the throne room. Jesus entered the most holy place on October 22, 1844, again in the presence of God, and the investigative judgment began. Pleading on behalf of his people against a law that could not be changed. Esther entered into the king's throne room to plead on behalf of her people against a law that could not be changed. She had one request, a mishta. And whenever there is a mishta, what always follows? A judgment. Folks, this is confirming everything that we know. And this was written 2,500 years ago. And it meets exactly what we know as Seventh-day Adventists is happening. So here is what it looked like. Here is Esther in the inner chamber, in the holy place, if you will. There is the king holding forth his scepter. The guard is waiting to see what the sign is going to be. And then she is let in into the king's chamber. And as she passes through that door, we hear signs of 1844. Here is a satellite image of the excavations of that very palace. Here we see the green dot symbolizing the outer court, the blue dot symbolizing the inner court, and the red dot symbolizing the throne room of the king. This is how we know exactly how it was laid out. Now, there's something that's really interesting about this. Because this action that she does takes place in the Shushan Palace, in Shushan, Persia. And when Esther moves in from the inner chamber into the king's throne room, again, we think about 1844 and the 2300-day prophecy. We think about Daniel. Question, where was Daniel when he received the vision of the 2300-day prophecy? Daniel chapter 8, verse 2. Look it up. Look up Daniel chapter 8, verse 2. Whoever has it, read it to me, because it's going to sound much better coming from somebody else. Daniel chapter 8, verse 2. This is where Daniel gets the vision of the 2300 days where he gets, where he sees Christ, where, he see, where he's given the vision of the 2300 days and the cleansing of the sanctuary. Daniel chapter 8. He doesn't understand it. You have it. Read it out loud. Daniel was in the very same place that Esther was when he received the vision of the 2300 days. He was in the Shushan Palace. Does that give you just chills? So let's review. After support for Mordecai and resigning to die, Esther fasted for three days and rose up on the third day, Nisan 16, put on her royal robes and went into the inner chamber and lived only because of her relationship with the king. She obtained favor in his eyes 
and then went into the throne room of the king where she pleaded for, a, for the lives of her people against the law that could not be changed. Jesus Christ, after support from the Holy Spirit, resigned to die. Jesus died and rested for three days and rose up on the third day, same day, Nisan 16, put on his royal robes and went into the holy place and lived only because of his relationship to God the Father. Then he obtained favor in his eyes and then went into the throne room of the King of Kings where he pleaded for the lives of his people against the law that could not be changed. So what happens next? This is amazing. The investigative judgment begins. What is the investigative judgment? It is two components. It's, it's one judgment, but it's divided into two components. The judgment of the dead, the righteous dead, and the judgment of the righteous living. Guess what? There's one banquet. How many nights? Two nights. It even says it there in Esther chapter 7, verse 2. On the second night of the banquet, so it's one banquet, two nights. So what is the essence of the investigative judgment? The essence of the investigative judgment is someone brings God the book. Then they open the books. And you look to see whose name is in the book, and you see, was this person rewarded? No. Then we should reward them with a robe of righteousness. Isn't that the investigative judgment? It is, isn't it? So guess what happens after the first banquet? The king can't sleep. And so the chamberlain brings him the books. And they open the books, and they start reading about Big Than and Teresh. Who's going to come up first in the investigative judgment? Adam and Eve, probably, right? They're going to go chronologically. Big Than and Teresh. Anyway, Mordecai, they see Mordecai, right? Has anyone rewarded Mordecai? Nope. Oh, Haman's coming in. Hey, Haman, what do you think I should do for, the, for the, someone that really, really pleases me? And he thinks it's him. Oh, well, you should do this and put the kingly robe on and run him around the streets. Perfect. Do that for Mordecai. So Mordecai, Mordecai, names comes up in the book, and he gets a robe, the kingly robe. I mean, this, this, is, this is like right, oh, you couldn't have designed a story better. Everything that we know as Seventh-day Adventists in terms of eschatology is coming true in this book of Esther, and it's happening in the very same order. So this is synonymous with the judgment of the dead. That's what's happening right now in heaven. The books are being opened. Rewards are being given to those who are written in the book. Haman leads Mordecai around on a horse proclaiming. That's like the three angels' message. Is Haman happy about this? No, he hates it. But he has to do it because civil authority is telling him he has to do it. Do you think that's the same that's going on right now? Do you think there's some religious entities that hate the fact that we're able to preach the three angels' message? It's only because of civil authority that's allowing us to do it. When that civil authority goes away, it's going to end. They're just waiting. In fact, what is Haman building at this very moment? He's building a gallows. And he has Mordecai's name on it. I want to hang Mordecai on those gallows, and I'm just waiting to ask the king for it. That's what he's waiting for. So after, this, after that first banquet, Haman has a horrible day. He comes home late because he's running around the town, Shushan, trying to show off Haman, and he's running ahead of him. And as soon as he gets home, guess what? The king's people are there to whisk him away to the second night of the banquet. What do you think the second night of the banquet has to do with? We just talked about the judgment of the righteous dead. Now we're talking about the judgment living. Now, what is it that starts the judgment of the righteous living? Do you remember what we talked about yesterday? 13, 14, 15? To get from 13 to 14, you have the National Sunday Law, right? And that's kind of what we believe might be the defining mark, although Ellen White says that nobody knows for sure. What is it that the National Sunday Law has? It is when Babylon completely falls. And so notice here, this is Esther 5. And Haman told him the glory of the riches and the multitude of his children. Does somebody else brag about how many children they have? They have many, many daughters, don't they? Uh-huh. And the daughters are going to go back to the mother. And all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and the servants of the king. Oh, yeah, he's very, very high up. 
Haman and moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared for myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. All, yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gates. Then Jerez his wife and all the friends said unto him, Let a gallows be made, fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the king pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. When you see the gallows, think Sunday law. Here's Ellen White. She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. How is this done? By forcing man to accept a spurious Sabbath. Listen carefully. Not yet, however, can it be said, she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has not yet made all nations do this. Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of church with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. Has Babylon completely fallen today? No. The fall of Babylon will be complete at that time. The change is a progressive one and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. So what happens? At the second banquet, you have all of the elements of the second angel's message, right? Fallen, fallen is Babylon, who made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Guess what happens at the second banquet? It's a wine banquet. The king finds out that Haman wants to kill the Jews. He's wrath. Haman falls down on the bed of Esther. I don't know how they ate back then, but apparently there were beds. Okay? Haman falls down. The king comes back in, and he thinks that Haman is trying to assault his wife. Fornicate. It's all there. All of the words in play are there at the second banquet. And what happens? We know that this is a play on the Sunday law because what happens? Haman gets hung on his own gallows. It is the very action of the mother church to cause a Sunday law to occur, which causes her to completely fall. Do you see that? It's the very action. By causing a law, enforcing Sunday, a spurious Sabbath, that very action causes that very church to fall in the eyes of God. It is a complete fall at that point. Haman, in trying to get rid of Mordecai, builds a gallows, and he's hung on the very gallows. Do you see that? It's amazing stuff. <clears throat> now what happens? We know from biblical eschatology that as soon as this happens, what breaks forth from heaven without any restraint? The latter rain. Who in the story is represented as the latter rain? Mordecai. He's the Holy Spirit. He's the one that encourages Esther. He's the one that visits Esther every day. And it's right at this moment that, hey, that um, Mordecai, where he was just led around the streets of Shushan before, now he becomes... He actually gets the ring from Haman, and now he gets to make the laws. Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman and him that they have hanged on the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you, in the king's name. And what does this Holy Spirit do, by the way? It seals. Doesn't it seal? Look how many times the word seal is used here. And seal it with the king's ring for writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring that may no man reverse. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof. By the way, if you actually calculate that date out, it's exactly 70 days from the death decree. 70, seven times 10, the perfect number. So essentially what's happening here is Mordecai is writing a new law in many different languages. It's sealed with the king's ring, and it's led out on horseback. Essentially, the Holy Spirit, Mordecai, is writing a new law that will allow the Jews to stand against the old law. And that is exactly what Christ is going to do, to allow us to stand against the death decree of Adam. 
And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel and blue and white and with a great crown of gold and with a garment of fine linen. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness and a feast for a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews. For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Can I restate that? Many came out of Babylon into the true church. You see this? Every aspect of what we know in the great controversy is being fulfilled in this book of Esther. So this closing events chart is perfect. And we're seeing it, the fulfillment. The Nisan 13, 14, and 15. Okay. So if it was that simple, at the very end of Esther, it should be, and they all got saved, and everything was fine, and happily after after, and, and okay, we're done. That's not how it happened. If you look at Esther chapter 9, you will see a couple of things. First of all, the story of Simon's Feast. We talked about Simon's Feast, right? Mary Magdalene. How much did she feel like she, was owed, like she owed Christ? 500 denarii. That was gratitude. That was, her, that was grace. And what did she actually do? She did something out of that gratitude. What was it? It was breaking the alabaster jar and pouring the spikenard onto Christ's feet. How much was that worth? 300. There is a, there is a feeling, there is a, a, a understanding, there is a faith, okay? And then there is a doing of that faith. 500? 300. Okay? So here we are now. We are in the last month of the year. This is where you have to pay attention. This happened at the beginning of the year, the first month, and now it's going to be executed at the end of the year, the end of time. And the way it gets dealt with is very different. The way the people in Shushan go through this is very different than the people in the provinces. There are way more Jews in the provinces than there are in Shushan. Shushan is a tiny capital. There are way more many Jews in the provinces. So the first thing that happens is they are saved over guess what? 13, 14, and 15. We see it again. And this is, what, this is what got me into the study of trying to figure out the 13, 14, and 15. This 13, 14, and 15, on the Adar, the last month, on the 13th day of the last month is when the old death decree was to be executed. So what happens in Shushan? If you read Esther chapter 9, the Jews in Shushan defend themselves. 500 attackers come against them, and they kill them all and also the ten sons of Haman, okay? But in the provinces, 75,000 attackers attack the Jews, and they are able to withstand all 75,000, and they survive. So, that's what happens on the 13th. Not a single Jew dies in this, in this conflagration. Great, we should be all done, right? No, they're saved. But Esther is not yet done. Who does Esther represent? Jesus. I don't want you to miss this. Esther goes back to the king. You're like, come on, Esther. You, you've kind of pushed this a little bit far, right? You've gotten what you want. You're asking for more. But Esther is no longer a little weak, uh, little weak queen who is tremulous. She has now had a year of experience, OK? She goes back to the king, and she boldly asks him for two things. So for whose sake is she asking this for? For her sake. She is the one that's asking for this. Does this sound familiar? Does Jesus ask for something for his sake? Yes, he does, actually. For my name's sake. Remember in, in, in uh, uh, Psalms 23? He leads me through the path of righteousness for whose sake? His sake. Remember Ezekiel 36? I do not this for your sake. I'm not going to make you righteous for your sake. I'm making it for my, I had pity on my holy name. Correct? Who is going to the king right now? Esther. She's not satisfied yet with the situation. What does she ask for? She asks for two things. Number one, she asks for one more day of fighting only in the capital, in Shushan. And number two, she wants the dead bodies of Haman hung on the gallows. Now, what do we say? Which day 
when we talked yesterday, which day of 13, 14, and 15 is the Sunday law active in? The 14th, that's correct. What does the gallows represent? Sunday law. And so what do we see here? We see on the very day that we believe the Sunday law is going to be effective in, the 14th, we see the gallows once again being erected. But this time, we see the 10 sons of Haman being put on them. And so this is what happens. This is exactly what happens. The king allows it to happen. And, and so while the provinces are resting on the 14th, while the provinces have no bearing on the 14th, what I'm saying is righteous Jews living in the provinces are not taking part in the actions on the 14th. They are resting. And to this day, when you celebrate Purim, most of the Jews who celebrate Purim celebrate it on the 14th of Nisan. That's where most of them do. But there is a special case of Jew. One who happens to be living in Shushan. One who happens to be witnessing the end events. One who happens to be there and see the gallows. What does the gallows represent? Sunday law. Is there a special type of Jew that's in Shushan? Can we take the application of this that maybe at the end there is going to be a special type of people at the end, a remnant, that is going to have a little different experience? Exactly. And so what do they do? This time they defend themselves against 300 attackers. And the 10 sons of Haman are hanged. Do you see the 500, the 300? Do you see that? What do you make of that? What does the 500 represent? The five, exactly, the debt. So those on the 13th feel the debt. They are like Mary Magdalene. And now what they do as a result of that debt, even though it doesn't make up for that debt, they are breaking the alabaster jar. They are pouring the spikenard. And they are the ones that will have an extra day of fighting on the 14th. And then finally, just as the 144,000 will be sealed on the 15th, so they too rest. In fact, today, there's a certain group of people, if they're in walled cities, celebrate Purim on the 15th. It's called a Shushan Purim. It's interesting, isn't it? Isn't this interesting? I think it's ex amazing. So 13, 14, and 15. Now, I want to show you. I remember I told you there was a secret message. OK, here's the secret message. It's the ten sons of Haman. When the ten sons of Haman's names are recorded in Esther, you have to understand, at Purim, there is a Jewish tradition that has gone on for 2,500 years, that at Purim, they read the book of Esther in Hebrew. And there are certain parts, when they read, that they read it all together. There's about four parts in the book of Esther. You, if you went to a Purim celebration, there would be a room filled like this, full of Jews, there would be a rabbi or a, a master at the, top, at the head, and they'd be reading it. And when he got to certain places in Esther, about four different places, they would all read it together. But that's not special enough, because this is one of the places, when they read the Ten Sons of Haman in Esther chapter 9, they all read it together, but they do something more than just that. They take a deep breath, and they read all the Ten Sons of Haman in one breath as if it were one long sentence. They've been doing this for 2,500 years. So the, this was, who was this requested by? Was this a requirement to save the Jews on the 13th? This is for Esther's benefit. She asked the king for this. You'll see. Remember, what Jesus Christ did. He said for his benefit, in Ezekiel 36, which happens right before Ezekiel 37, which is the dry bones chapter, which is when the resurrection occurs. This is right before the resurrection. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel have profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which is profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God. 
when I, am, I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Now, notice what he's going to do it. How is he going to do it? Watch. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And then what is he going to do? I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit. He's going to give you a new creation and I will put it in you and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Is that what he says he's going to do? Yes. That's what he says he's going to do. Okay? Check this out. So, as I said, the ten sons of Haman, it's read at the festival on Adar 14. It's also the only place in the book of Esther where the, where the names are written vertically as if they are hanging on the gallows, on the page. If you look, if normally the Hebrews write from right to left, right to left, right to left. It's an interesting thing. Anyone, any culture, check me out on this, any culture east of Jerusalem writes right to left. Any culture west of Jerusalem writes left to right. See if I'm right on that. I'm trying to think of exceptions. But generally speaking, that's kind of what happens. But in Jerusalem, they write right to left. Here's the only place in the Hebrew Bible where they stop doing that. They still write right to left. But you can see that those, those letters there that are the same on the left-hand side, that's the word and. So this and this and this. Look it up in Esther chapter 9 where they read the ten sons of Haman. So what are the weird things about this? Number one, they all read it together. It's listed vertically. And this is the only place. Everybody takes a deep breath. And they say all ten sons' names. And these are Persian names, because Haman grew up in Persia. Everyone clear on this? And we're, what, think about what this is. This is on the 14th, and this is happening at the request of Esther. All right, let's put it together. So you take the, this is what I did. I took the, the ten names, and there they are in actual Hebrew. So these are Persian names that have sounds associated with them, and they can be written in Hebrew, and that's how we have them today. They're Persian names written in Hebrew, okay? And here are the names. So let's try it. All right, everyone take a deep breath. We're going we're gonna to pretend that we're at the Feast of Purim here. All right. Can you do this? Take a look. Hopefully you have uh, good lungs. All right, here we go. Parshadatha, Delphon, Aspatha, Paratha, Adalia, Eridatha, Parmasatha, Erisai, Eridai, and Vajdatha. Very good. Okay. Do you want to know what you just said? Yeah. Yes, you do. So what I did was I took a number of different standard dictionaries. So Strong's, Brown, Driver, Briggs, Hitchcock's, and a number of them. Why? Because not all of these names are in all of those dictionaries. So I had to find them. I had to find them. I had to dig. Each one of these words, each, each one of these names, means something. So I want you to think about this. For 2,500 years, without even knowing what they're doing, the Jews have been preserving this statement over and over again since Esther. And this is what it means. Parshadatha means given by prayer. Delphon means rain. Aspatha means gathering of men like the harvest and protect. Paratha means fruitful. Adalia means to draw up. Eridatha, harvest and new and noble birth. Parmasata means a yearling bull. Erisai means lion-like. Eridai means the lion is enough, excellent, and worthy. And Vajdatha means sprinkling the chamber of purity and white. So allow me a little bit of license, and we take those, and we come up with a statement like this. I want you to think about Ezekiel 36. I want you to think about everything that happens. I want to think about who this is, where this is, and who requested it, and who's kept it preserved for all this time. Given by prayer. You know what's given by prayer. The latter rain. Given by prayer, the rain shall gather men like the harvest. Protect them, and they shall be fruitful. 
for he will draw up the harvest and give a new and noble birth to them. For he is a yearling bull, but he's also like a lion, and he is enough, excellent, and worthy to sprinkle the chamber and purify them and make them white. And that happens on the 14th day, which is exactly the day that we need it to happen on. And it's at the request of Esther, who represents Jesus, who says, I will do this for my holy name. Do you see that? For 2,500 years, the Jews have been saying this every single year, almost as if they're waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. So here's Rabbi Levi Kaplan. And if you ask him, you can look him up on YouTube. He said, why do we do this, Rabbi? He says, there are four places in the Megillah where the congregants join the reader, and those four places are areas that talk about redemption. Those spots mark a change, something great that happened, something that ushers in the victory, redemption, salvation of the Jewish people at that time. And those places are Esther 2.5, Esther 8.15-16, and Esther 10.3. But this is the fourth place in Esther chapter 9. However, this is not the case when we talk about the ten sons of Haman. So why is it that the ten sons of Haman are recited by the congregation? And he goes on to give three very scholarly and not so scholarly as admitted reasons why. He half jokes that uh, one day when the reader went to read the passage in one breath, he paused, perhaps too long, for that breath, and this triggered the congregation to start reading the passage as one, uh, a little on the Purim side, he admits. The second he asserts is that the reader must say each word clearly and in one breath. There's a chance that he could miss one of the words. Since it is absolutely essential that each word be conveyed at a reading, it was necessary for each member of the congregation to say those names. The rabbi's third reason, though, is, um, is probably the most important for us today. This is his thoughts. He says, quote, reading the ten sons in one breath is something that every person must experience on their own. We cannot fulfill our obligation, so to speak, by having someone else breathe for us. We have to recite the names of Haman's children in one breath of ours. Just as we can't appoint someone else to fill in for us, we can't hire a proxy to breathe for us. So too, with the reading of the Megillah, we have to experience reading the names in one breath. So there are the ten sons of Haman. Given by prayer, the rain shall gather men like the harvest, protect them, and they shall be fruitful. For he will draw up the harvest and give a new and noble birth to them. For he is a yearling bull, but also a, like a lion, and he is enough, excellent, and worthy to sprinkle the chamber and purify them and make them white. Those are for the people in Shushan. So if you think about what you just saw here, was there somebody else that prayed for the rain? Who else prayed for the rain? Elijah. Who has that Elijah message? Seventh-day Adventists. Elijah represents the 144,000 because he did not die but was translated. He was taken care of by ravens in the wilderness. He has a message for the end time. Five, either follow God or follow Baal. And he prayed for the rain. And he prayed seven times. And you think about seven times sprinkling as the Day of Atonement. Naaman had to bathe seven times. So I believe that the key to get that latter rain, or to get the Holy Spirit, is really, if we could only know how Elijah prayed for that rain. He prayed seven times. If we could only know how Elijah, what was going through, if we could just be a fly on the rock listening to Elijah or know what was in his head, we would know the secret to how we need to pray for the Holy Spirit. Well, if we go to 1 Kings 18, 41 to 44, we can read the Bible. And Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up and eat and drink. And there was a sound of an abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now and look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain not stop thee. Well, that, wasn't, that was nice to know, but it wasn't very helpful about what was in his mind, right? Wouldn't it be great if we had some source, somebody to tell us what was in Elijah's mind? We do. Aren't we blessed to have the spirit of prophecy? 
because Ellen White wrote exactly what was in Elijah's mind in the Review and Herald, May 26, 1891. And we'll end on this. We'll end the whole thing on this, because really, this is the whole crux of the matter. She starts off, before the sacrifice, Elijah had said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. After the destruction of the prophets of Baal, Elijah said to Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound and an abundance of rain. After the king's departure, Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. When he had bidden Ahab to go up and eat and drink, did he have an evidence that there were showers were about to fall? Did he see the clouds in the heavens? Did he see the rain or hear the thunder? No. He spoke these words because of the Spirit of the Lord had moved upon his mind and led him to believe that his prayer would be heard. He had done all that was possible. He had done all that was possible to make manifest his faith. And now he began to pray for the outpouring of the abundance of rain. How did Elijah pray? Watch. He said to his servant, go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. The servant watched while Elijah prayed. Six times he returned from the watch saying, there is nothing, no cloud, no sign of rain. But the prophet did not give up in discouragement. He kept reviewing his life to see where he had failed to honor God. He confessed his sins and thus continued to afflict his soul before God while watching for a token that his prayer was answered. As he searched his heart, he seemed to be less and less, both in his own estimation and in the sight of God. It seemed to him that he was nothing and that God was everything. And when he reached the point of renouncing self, while he clung to the Savior as his only strength and righteousness, that's when the answer came. The servant appeared and said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain not stop thee. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab robed and went to Dresreel. And the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah, and he girded up of his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Do you remember what John the Baptist said? He must increase, and I must decrease. I'm going to share with you two more slides before we finish, and that is what Ellen White says right after this, and I found it to be very poignant for us. She says, there are many lessons to be drawn from the experience of Israel and of the prophet of God. We are living in a time of apostasy similar to the time of which we have read, for there is a great religious declension in the churches among the professed people of God. The children of God should have a realization of their accountability and should direct their hearts toward God, seeking for strength and grace with an earnestness which they have never before manifested. There was never a there was never there never was more solemn time in the history of the world than the time in which we are now living. Our eternal interests are at stake, and we should arouse to the importance of making our calling and election sure. We dare not risk our eternal interests on mere probabilities. We must be in earnest. What we are, what we are doing, what is to be our course of action in the future, all are questions of untold moment, and we cannot afford to be listless, indifferent, or unconcerned. It becomes each one of us to inquire, what is eternity to me? Are the feet in the path that leads to heaven or on the broad road that leads to perdition? All around us, the world is manifesting intense activity, there is a feeling of apprehension among all people. They are looking for some great event, but know not what it is to be. The state of affairs in Europe excites men's fears, and all are looking for those things that shall come upon the earth, and their hearts are failing for fear. The nations are filled with anxiety, and there is a spirit of unrest and tumult on every hand. If ever there was a time when men should know their position, it is now. No man can afford to go on blindfolded. No, knowing what road he is traveling, but careless and hoping to come out in the end right, for great and disastrous will be his awakening. 
those who do not appreciate eternal life enough to work diligently for it will never obtain it. Those who are seeking earthly pleasures, worldly gain and honor will never make a success of winning eternal life unless they repent and turn to God with all their hearts. She wrote that in 1891. So, we have the plan of salvation. We have the sanctuary. We have seen God's signature. And we have asked, is it possible that God has a signature? And the answer, I believe, is yes. And the question is, does the signature open up other doors in that room? And the answer is yes. And I believe that only those that have and understand the sanctuary will be able to understand these things. And that is why we need to get the word of the sanctuary out and have people understand it. All heaven is interested in the happiness of man. Our Heavenly Father does not close the avenues of joy to any of his creatures. The divine requirements call upon us to shun those indulgences that would bring suffering and disappointment, that would close to us the door of happiness in heaven. The world's Redeemer accepts men as they are, with all their wants, imperfections, and weaknesses. And he will not only cleanse us from sin and grant redemption through his blood, but he will satisfy the heart longing of all who consent to wear his yoke, to bear his burden. It is the purpose to impart peace and rest to all who come to him for the bread of life. He requires us to perform only those duties that will lead our steps to heights of bliss to which the disobedient can never attain. The true joyous life of the soul is to have Christ formed within the hope of glory. So, Here's our final call to action. Where you are, let us do these five things as we leave. Number one, make time in our daily life for a relationship with God. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. We need to have that relationship with God. Meditate on Christ and Him crucified. That is what Mary Magdalene did. She had that personal experience she realized that he personally saved her, and it was out of that gratitude that she was able to do what she did. She didn't even realize what she was doing was difficult. It came naturally for her. Number three, ask him to identify the sins in your life and cooperate with God in putting them away for good. Do you know that when Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, that's really difficult to do. Can we raise anybody from the dead? No, but was there a role for man to play in the resurrection of Lazarus? He, they, Christ asked them to roll the stone away. If Christ would have raised Lazarus from the dead, it would have been to no effect if the stone was not rolled away. He would have been stuck in a dark tomb. For him to have the fullness, you have to roll the stone away. God allows us to cooperate with him in raising to new life. And if you think about it, who probably got the best experience out of that resurrection? Those that stood by and watched or those that actually rolled the stone away? I bet you those people that rolled the stone away will never, ever forget. And so God allows us to be his hands, to be part of his body, and he allows us to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in getting rid of our sins so that we may be prepared. We need to start to study the issues of righteousness by faith. I don't know how it's going to happen, but based on the Last Supper, I believe that is the next greatest event that is going to occur in this church. It is a reawakening of the understanding of righteousness by faith. Learn those issues. Figure out what happened in 1888. And then finally, it's very easy on an Adventist campus to feel sometimes like you're not worthy, like you don't fit in, like maybe you're not good enough. That's very easy to happen. Remember that Christ accepts you exactly how you are, but he doesn't want to leave you the way you are. And so that, when Satan tells you this, because it's only Satan that tells you this, that you're not good enough, he doesn't want you to get involved. One of the things to help that I found that's very helpful is when you start to be involved in teaching other people this, it is an amazing thing. Don't feel like you have to be better before you can start to teach. You can reach out where you are and where you are, and in doing that, you will be imbued with the Holy Spirit. So teaching is the best way of learning. When you teach something, you have to learn it good. Okay? 
And that's when, you, that's when you grow. So do not feel, number one, if you ever feel like you're not good enough, that is Satan talking to you. Okay? Yes, we can improve. God is going to help you with that. But God will take you immediately the way you are. You know, we've talked about how probation is going to close on the church fairly early. It's not going to be next month. There's a number of things that have to happen. But each one of us individually, we have no idea what's going to happen to us when we walk out of these doors. Right? We don't know when our probation is going to close. That's why we must always have oil in our lamps. So we are not awakened at an early hour and we don't know what happens. So make time in our life, meditate on Christ, ask him to identify your sins in your life, cooperate with God in doing that, start to study the issues of righteousness by faith and teach others what it is that you've learned. And hopefully this weekend will change your life. Please stand with me as we, as we end. Dear Lord, thank you so much for such a wonderful weekend, and we have seen that your spirit has moved uh, among us, myself included, that this is really what it is that you want, and that we have, we have understood more fully your word and the sanctuary, and we will now read with renewed interest in the stories of the Bible, that they are not just two-dimensional, old stories. They are alive, that the Bible is a living word, a two-edged sword. Please help us to internalize these things, to, to meditate on them. And as we go out, to give us strength to spread your word and the three angels' message. Please bless everybody here. I'll give everybody safe travel. Help all of them in their studies. Help them to be successful in thy way, in thy name. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, symposium. <laughs> We're not through. Uh, we do have some questions um, from the online audience uh, that is also watching today. And then we'll also take some questions here as well. Let me see if I can read this from one of our uh, sophomore students. Uh, can you explain more about new light is I have had people use these exact quotes that you used Friday night to show me that we should be keeping the feasts. Uh -huh. How do we not take these truths too far with feast keeping, et cetera? So that's a very good question, and I, I probably should have qualified at the very beginning. I believe that we can learn a lot from the feasts. I believe that there's a lot of type and anti-type in there. I do not believe in keeping the feasts. I think Ellen White's very clear that when Christ died on the cross, that the Passover feast basically was irrelevant at that point. He had basically put an end to that. Now, in terms of new light, that's the thing that, uh, that is very important. There is going to be new light. There's no question about it. We are in an in increasing light, and we're always going to learn new things. But the key to that is taking what is correct and discarding what is false. And Isaiah 8.20, that's why I put that at the very end of those quotes, Isaiah 8.20, to the law and to the testimony. What is the testimony? Spirit of prophecy. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And so keeping the feasts, keeping the Passover feast, keeping all of these feasts, is not, uh, we, we were not ever given any light on that. And so that would be something that uh, is, is uh, not, and I would be careful, by the way, for things that are salvational. New light is going to add meat on the bones. What I always am a little bit concerned about is when people say, this is new light, you need to accept it, and if you don't, you're gonna be lost. Okay, that's a problem for me. What is it that saves us? Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Everything else is adding to it. So, so, keep it, so telling me that keeping the feasts is, uh, is something that is salvational, no. No, we haven't been given that light. And that is, goes against what we have as, as previous light. Uh, I know that the, using the feast is an example, but in generally speaking, again, new light will ever come in, but it must agree with what has gone before. God is not going to give us confusion. That's Babylon. God is going to give us things that correlate. All right, another question from one of our college students. What is the significance of the week between the 14th of Nisan and the 21st in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
Yeah, so um, it's a whole week of unleavened bread. It, it was to celebrate the seven days that it took the Israelites to leave Egypt and then finally get across the Red Sea. Um, if you look into that, it's a little bit um, unclear. It took them about three days to reach the Red Sea, but then there were some things that happened at the Red Sea, and then finally they crossed. But traditionally, the Jews celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread as the time it took to get them from Egypt to the wilderness, because we know, in terms of their food, God supplied manna at that point on. I don't know if there's a significance in terms of eschatological, but I do know that on the 15th, there begins a seven-day feast of unleavened bread. And even though that takes us out a few days, um, I see it as a seven period of time where you're not consuming anything that has leaven in it. In other words, a period of sinlessness, which actually starts the day before on the 14th in preparation for that. All right, and then a question also related to this last message. Esther and Vashti are both asked to come before the king. Mm -hmm. One refuses to accept the crown and the other accepts all the king offers her and takes nothing else. Are these two different churches? Well, it, it's certainly possible. In, in, in our uh, play on it, if you will, uh, Vashti represents Lucifer because you know, he went against the king and he was deposed but not killed. And we've, of course, already gone through with what Esther represents for a number of, there's either many coincidences or it's, it, it actually plays into it because Esther has this duality and she's able to bridge the gap between the royal throne and, and the Jews. So, um, yes, it, it, a woman in the Bible represents the church. There may be another different meaning there, but in terms of looking at the entire great controversy, Esther fulfills the role of Christ in that, uh, in that play. But this is what I said. The Bible obviously has multiple meanings on multiple levels. So. Okay, any questions here among our face-to-face -face group? Yes, question here. Yeah. You have a microphone coming. So I appreciated what you said about um, God knew that man was going to sin, and so he had already a plan. That's why the sanctuary was in heaven before it was ever on earth. But why then was the, I mean, I understand the Ten Commandments. That was his, God's character. But why the bud and the manna? The, the oh, rod. Oh, the, the rod. Oh, Aaron's rod, the bud, and the manna. You know, I, I haven't really studied that extensively. I'm not sure. Is, uh, I'll ask you, is, is there a, uh, Aaron's rod and uh, manna in heaven? Or is that just in the, I'll have to look into that. So I'm not sure. Yeah. All right, another question from one of our college students. I guess this is more directed to administration, uh, but <laughs> was it intentional that, that, that this weekend was the 13th through the 15th? <laughs> and, I didn't uh, even notice that, actually. That's, that's very interesting. <laughs> and uh, it was not intentional, <laughs> but uh, it uh, may have been prophetic. May have been prophetic. <laughs> uh, any other questions uh, from here? I know I had one, one yesterday there. as well. There's one over here. Good. And I'm going to try to find one from a student yesterday that I'm having trouble locating. Go ahead. Time to share with us a little bit about your testimony. How God brought you from your uh, teenager, I mean, being a teenager and becoming a physician, and then, uh, you know, and uh, how you start studying the Bible. Just a short testimony. Oh, you, possible. okay, that could take a little while. Um, so, how, so the question is, is my testimony how I went from a teenager to being where I am now? It's totally God. I, I, it, it's kind of a long story. I, I mean, I grew up in a regular Adventist home, a very good Adventist home. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, you start to get involved with things like school and college, and you don't, you know, make as much time for God as you, as you would normally have. But uh, looking back over my time, I could see how God was grooming me for this type of, of a situation. I did a lot of teaching. I uh, tutored a lot in, in college. Um, I learned to get up in front of people and speak. I did a speech class. I was horrible in speech. Um, I had gotten a D in French. I almost didn't even get into the university because of that. They didn't, university of California didn't consider that a passing grade. 
Um, uh, fortunately, they went back and looked at my grade, and they decided to change. I don't know how, but they decided to change. It was God. And, and I finally got into college. Um, I met my wife first year in chemistry class. And that's a whole other story. Um, yeah, she, she knew she wanted to be a doctor from the day she, she came out of the womb with a stethoscope. I mean, she knew she wanted to be a doctor. She, she knew exactly what she had to do. She had a 4.8 GPA from high school, straight A's, never got an A minus in her life. And I looked at her and I said, why can't I do that? And so um, there's this sort of back and forth, uh, kind of a courtship a little bit. And I started to delude myself thinking, if I just got better grades, maybe she'd pay attention to me. And so I started to get better grades. And um, after we got married, she said, you know what really attracted me to you is when you started getting better grades. <laughs> so I deluded myself into actually thinking something that was actually true. It was, it was bizarre. Um, but uh, so, and this might be helpful to some of you here. I was, both my wife and I went to the University of California, Riverside, a very you know, secular university. Uh, Christian, uh, Christians on campus, n nevertheless, I mean, but evolution served up on a plate every day, every day. And so um, I was pathologically shy. First quarter, first year, chemistry class, I, I had an eye on Betty, my wife. She was, the, she was the most beautiful girl in the class. Very smart, always sat at the front of the class. She was in my lab section. And uh, I was so shy that I couldn't even get her name. The only way I could get her name this is so embarrassing. Uh, at the end of the quarter, when you check in your glassware, and you, you know you got to put the glassware in and make sure it hasn't broken, you got to go up to the front and put your name on a clipboard so that the TA can come and make sure you're. So I watched for her to go up, put her name down, and I ran up <laughs> to see what her name was. This is how pathologically shy I was. Um, it was not. It was not a good thing. Anyway, she was Catholic. Okay? Her family was Catholic. Not only was she Catholic, she was Polish. And the Pope was Polish. Okay? So you know that... So this was a... You know, I knew that this wasn't going to work. And so early on, you know, she, as we started to get to know each other, it first started out as studying. As we first started to... You could see things were going a little bit... You know how it is in relationships. Things start to get a little bit more chummy, right? And I started to realize this is, this is not good. I've always been raised that, you know, I need to marry a Seventh-day Adventist. You need to be equally yoked. And I knew this. And so I said, you know, um, you're Catholic and I'm Seventh-day Adventist. And she's like, well, what's the difference? And I'm like, oh, boy, we're the angels. <laughs> thought it was on candid camera. So I, 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 I realized, I said, look, I don't want to go down this road. And, and, and it's going to be more difficult after I know somebody. So I handed her the great controversy. I said, if you can read this, then you'll understand. And she read it, and she said, you know what? It makes sense. And to make a long story short, she was baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist before we proposed. I wanted to make sure that this was not, I was not coercing her. She had to do this on her own. Um, she did it, and she became a Seventh-day, she teaches Sabbath school in the kids' lessons. It's just amazing. Her mother, uh, unfortunately, her, her father passed away um, early. Um, her mother, she's a, she's a, she's a European. <laughs> she likes her churches. Um, but one day, we were working on her, one day she was sitting in the church, and the, the priest got up and said, you know, um, there are many things that we do in the Catholic Church that are not in the Bible, and uh, this week marks the week of whatever, and we're uh, honoring the Virgin Mary. And even though we don't have any biblical evidence for this, our tradition says that we should do this, this, that, and the other. And my mother-in-law basically is like, forget this, what am I doing here? These people are just making things up. It's not even in the Bible. And she walked out of that church, and she never went back. And she was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church as well. So it's, I've been very blessed. And uh, that's really been kind of my walk, and I can see looking back all of what God has done, and he's doing it in your lives too. You just don't know it. Maybe you do know it, but you don't know the half of it, and we all know it when we get to heaven. So that's a long answer to your question. So uh, have you learned anything this weekend? I think there was a lot to learn in each one of those presentations. Fortunately, they're recorded, uh, and it's uh, worthwhile to go back 
through that because there was probably, you know, maybe even more about a, than a hundred instructional points per presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and I so told you it would be a, a styrofoam it, cup it and knife. It might microphone. have been uh, for, uh, for some of our earlier Weimar students or younger ones, it might have been a little bit of information overload, but it is recorded. And uh, we would certainly encourage you to go through that again. We have another question, is that right? Okay, go ahead. Another question. Um, thank you for this. This is my favorite for obvious reasons. <laughs> but, Her name um, is Esther. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that, um, so Esther says, if I perish, I perish. So we believe Jesus is 100% man, but we also believe he's 100% God. So how would that, do we have the answer to that? That is a mystery, and I think Ellen White says we'll be solving that mystery in eternity, the mystery of salvation, how God, how Jesus was 100% man, but also 100% God. It's true. Well, Dr. Uh, Schwelt, we have oh. a special gift on behalf of Weimar uh, for you, uh, your wonderful wife, and I think there's even some gifts in here for your 15-year-old. Wow. <laughs> And, oh, uh, wonderful. 11 and 10 year old. Thank you so but much. This is uh, primarily from uh, the Weimart. And, um, Thank you so much. And, and the Weimart has a lot of wonderful things. If there's something in there that you um, don't think you want to use, uh, the head of our Weimart is sitting right here. <laughs> and she said she would exchange it for you. Oh, so okay. if you want to go no. through the Weimart and, and look through wow. it, you're certainly uh, welcome to do that. Uh, but I think you'll find a lot of, um, of wonderful uh, things for you and your family there and give you some remembrance of Weimar. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's, uh, I, as I said, it was something that was on, it was a spot on my wall. It was something that I was looking forward to for a very, very long time. And um, fortunately, I'll be back in February, I think. That's right. He's yeah. coming back for the Emotional Intelligence Summit, giving a couple of scientific presentations. Uh, at that time, um, related um, to COVID, of yeah. course, and also related to the mental health issues behind COVID. Um, we're seeing a lot more mental health issues, not only due to the response to COVID, but also due to COVID itself. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, we'll be centering in on uh, those two aspects. Plus, we'll have many other speakers from around the nation and the world. So. Uh, uh, be sure and tune in for the Emotional Intelligence Summit, February 18 through 21. You may not have room for that basket. If you <laughs> don't, you can leave it. But if you do, that basket is yours. Okay, thank well. you. Yeah, I was going to wonder. I was going to ask if you sell suitcases at the shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh, let's stand as we close this colloquium. Father in heaven, what a blessing it has been to, uh, to open up your word and to um, see it from a new perspective, to see even the math and the days and the um, feasts ha pointing to new and deeper truths concerning you and your love for us and the fact that you do take care of your own just as you took care of Esther in your own in Israel, you will take care of your own through thick and thin as we prepare to go through a crisis and a time of trouble such as this world has never seen. We pray, Lord, that we, these um, sessions will indeed inspire us to draw close to you to draw close to your word and to drink daily of your fountain and to express that love and truth to those around us as you did when you were here on this earth. And we thank you for Dr. Schwelt. Bless him. Bless him in his work, in his ministry. Bless his family. And uh, may he continue to spread this good news around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.